but nothing happened but here we go we are now recording now sometimes that symbol will disappear but it will still be recording all right so we ah here comes david so i'd like to get more people here before i start recording so i don't record everybody's name as they come in but i guess i have to do it so that gives us four students myself and yep total of five okay so i understood there were no questions issues concerned or anything else um i guess what we probably can do while we're waiting for others to show up let me just give a quick rehash of what we're going to be doing today okay we've just got basically one slide left in chapter 19. A little bit more to talk about in chapter 19, but only one slide. Okay? Now, excuse me. Uh, man. Okay, I don't know. My computer's been doing those kind of silly beeping. I guess it's when I'm receiving emails or something. I wish it would shut up, but you know, I can't turn off sound, then I can't hear you. Uh, so anyway, um, here what we've got um, just a slide or two left in this chapter then we'll go on and get started in chapter uh, 20 okay now we will stop today again like we did last time at 415 rather than 445 okay because we do have a lab today I do not think the lab will take us a full two hours but we're allowed two hours of lab time we'll take whatever time we need uh, so we'll we'll do the lab from 415 till 615 though I think y'all will be through before that okay I posted the labs out there in uh, blackboard messages I don't know if any of you saw it I had to get them ready and type up one part of them and um, okay wait a minute here's Caitlin let me get her in okay Caitlin's here okay and um, I had to one of them's in Word so I could do that pretty easily the other part I had to take pictures and get it in PDF format and send that so it's in not quite as good a shape but it's hopefully readable so if you haven't printed those pieces off you may not be able to now but um, that's what we'll be doing in the lab today the part of the lab that came from the lab manual it's only got five questions okay <laughs> and it's a 25 point lab so I came up with other things to do for the other 20 points so we'll go over that and how to do it but you're pretty much going to be your own on your own for doing it it's kind of going to be that part is going to kind of be like the um, remember the rocks and minerals lab where you uh, did the yeah okay it won't be that involved I don't have a specific website to go to but you all are going to need to find you places to locate things and then record the information okay I know that's pretty vague but that's what we'll be doing in the lab if any of you printed them out and say where do we get this stuff we'll talk about that when it's lab time okay so at 415 stop me because we need to move on to the lab okay uh, so let's see have we got everybody we're going to get we only got five people here one two three four five and I'll just put four of you in the wrong day no two of you in the wrong day but that's okay all right all right any questions before we get going today now oh here's one coming in and only one okay Well, I know you're in here. There you are. I have to go halfway across the page here, and it's hard to keep on track. 
okay there we go you're really over here okay so we should have six students here yep six students so far all right any questions now I'm actually backtracking just a tad on you here um, right as we we're ending class we had this slide which oh, I can't get to come up there we go okay <laughs> okay and I, we sort of rushed it did anyone have any questions on this this is just entitled other features and what we were talking about before this was volcanic activity right that's when magma comes up and reaches the surface of the earth and becomes lava cools and forms um, volcanic rock okay but most of the time most of the time the magma stays underground it's still liquid rock and it comes up so far and hardens before it gets to the surface that's what we're talking about in this slide these are other features that are caused by magma but are not volcanic activity okay magma volcanic activity is when the magma reaches the surface and becomes lava and then you have all the mess that happens with volcanoes okay these are other features that are caused when the magma comes up but doesn't break the surface and here are those features the biggest one they mention here is called a batholith okay lith by the way means rock okay so I don't know what the prefix batho means but it's a big chunk of rock underneath the surface the magma came up but didn't break the surface but in coming up it bit the surface you see it folded because this was hot okay magma is hot really really hot and that bit the sedimentary rock upward okay making a fold and when it folded up here now if you can imagine these layers here probably went on up and formed some sort of an arch or an anticline but when it did that it stretched them stressed them and they probably eroded away in time and made their way back down here to other sedimentary layers okay or got washed away or something else like that and when they did that they exposed some of the igneous rock that forced them up in the first place so that's why you would have a hill here or a string of hills that would be igneous rock but it would not be volcanic rock it came from magma but it hardened underground more than likely forming granite and this is where you would get your granite chains of hills mountains or whatever when that happened the upper layers which were on top of all this eroded away over time leaving that that's called a batholith especially underground that big extrusion of magma is a batholith when it folded up the uh, sedimentary layers it left ridges here where they broke the surface okay at where they were eroded that's what they call the hogback okay somebody's microphone is on and it may be distracting to others I'll talk over anything but if that's distracting to you I'm guessing maybe it's David's David did you know your microphone's on David can you hear David are you even listening are you distracted by all that going on around you okay if y'all can think of any way to get David's attention okay
Okay, maybe that did it. It got quieter anyway. Okay, his microphone is still on, but at least the noise has gone away. I couldn't tell. I, okay, no problem. I couldn't tell if that was a TV or if it was actually people talking. Uh, okay, no problem. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and by the way, who was that? Nakaya? Or was it David? All right, whoever. Okay, so that was a batholith, and that was a hogback. The hogback would be the ridge of sedimentary rock that had been pushed up, and the ridge where the erosion stopped and the, the sedimentary rock continued. That's the hogback. Now, a smaller protrusion upward that just breaks through some of the... Um, sedimentary layers but doesn't cause any specific surface features here but you run into this usually underground that's called the stock it's like a batholith that didn't reach the surface usually smaller but it's a intrusion of magma into underground layers of sedimentary or other rock okay now another type of intrusion is not a big intrusion like that, but a very small intrusion. Basically, the magma finds a weakness in those layers and pushes away, sometimes all the way to the surface, sometimes not. Okay? If there are vertical intrusions like that, very thin, just finding cracks or crevices to go through, the vertical ones are called dikes. Okay? And you can sometimes see a ridge or something on the surface where the dike has emerged. And suddenly you get sedimentary rock and find some igneous rock in the middle of it. Okay. Other times the dikes don't reach the surface, but you'll run into them underground. Those are vertical or near vertical intrusions, usually thin cracks. Sometimes those dikes will come up and hit a weakness in a horizontal layer. And then they start, start filling the horizontal layers. Those intrusions that are more horizontal than vertical, those are called sills, S-I-L-L. -L. Okay? Now, again, you'll probably never use these terms again, but if you ever do see them, you'll realize what they are. Now, let's say you had a dike that found a weakness near the surface and bent up some of the uh, surface layer uh, layers, you know, folded them upward. That's an anticline again here, an arching fold, but didn't quite break through the surface like a batholith. Number one, because they didn't have nearly as much of a source because they were coming through a very small dike, but they did make hills, raised intrusions. The top of this is still sedimentary rock. Now, some of that may have eroded away, but still the top is sedimentary rock, sedimentary layers. But you don't have to go down very far until you find the magma that pushed its way up. Okay? That's called the lacolith. Okay? It's kind of like a batholith, except that was a big intrusion that did some major folding. This is a much smaller intrusion. The weakness was found fairly close to the surface and bent the surface upward. Okay, folded the surface upward is a better way to say it. And even though the surface rock is still sedimentary, you may have layers where the erosion has occurred, but most of this is still sedimentary, but you don't have to go very far before you find the igneous rock that caused it. Okay, those are those, I think it's nine surface fixtures. Batholith, hogback, dike, stock, sill, lacolith. Is that six? Yeah, six, six terms there. Okay. So, anyway, that picture sort of illustrates those. Any questions on those features? I was afraid we rushed them too much at the end last time. Any questions? Okay. So, what's our overall pictures here? Okay. Now, I can't find 
specifically where this comes from in the text. It's kind of, oh yeah, there it is. Uh, it's on page 499 if you got this book, uh, 1919 if you don't have the big book. Um, overall picture, mountain ranges are composites of many different processes. Each of them uniquely structured. That means each of the mountain ranges. You have some folding, perhaps because magma uh, in, intruded upward but didn't break the, break the surface. Folding the, excuse me, I've got his knees, sorry. I hope that didn't blow your ears off. Okay. But I have to make sure y'all are awake every now and then, right? Okay. So some of this, some of those features we we're just showing folded the surface but didn't break through. Some of it may have caused faulting to occur. Okay, that's breaking through the sedimentary layers, okay, along a fault plane. And you know there's different kinds of folds or different kinds of faults. And some of the mountain ranges may have volcanic activity there too. The volcanic activity that didn't come to the surface may have caused some of the folding and perhaps some of the faulting as well. So these are all kind of mixed in there. Now I say that, but then let me back off. In the Appalachian Mountains, you're not going to find, I don't think, a single volcanic mountain there. I've never heard of one in all of the Appalachians. That's mostly folded, maybe some faulting. Okay. The Rockies, pretty much the same. The difference is mostly faulted, maybe some folding, but probably, perhaps, oh, oops, here comes Nakaya. She must have had to leave and come back. So let me see. I've already got her here. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, I think you'll find the Rockies to be more faulted mountains, fault block mountains, fewer folding, though you'll probably find some, and occasionally you might find some volcanic activity there. For instance, Yellowstone is basically in the Rockies, so yeah, there's certainly some volcanic activity there. Most of it fairly old. The, what they call the presidential range right along the uh, Pacific coast in Oregon, Washington, Oregon, actually extends up into Canada as well, and in the Northern California, those are probably predominantly volcanic activity with some probably folding and some faulting too. And here comes Harry. Okay, so let me get Harry here. Okay, so, but you'll have some of it. So you see, your mountain ranges will be composites, different processes, each uniquely structure, different activity there. Now, this is especially apparent along converging plate boundaries. For instance, the Himalayans. The Himalayans are where the uh, Asian plate is converging with the India Australian plate and at that point they're both continental plates though the India plate has some uh, oceanic crust in it as well but at that point it's all continental crust and where those are colliding you have probably I don't uh, hard to say which I would say probably more faulting you probably have some folding and you certainly have some volcanic activity. Probably not as much as you would expect, but probably some. Okay, where you have converging plate boundaries. Now, where you have oceanic plates converging with continental plates, you have this, and when I said the presidential range along the west coast of the US um, and Canada, um, Washington, Oregon, and, and Northern California, boy, you have, that's predominantly volcanic activity there because you have that 
plate going underneath, creating heat, creating um, uh, unstable conditions, probably breaking some some uh, edges and, and making cracks and stuff. The the hot lava rock makes its way, to, uh, uh, magma makes its way to the surface, becomes like lava, and becomes a volcano. So that's apparent along converging plate boundaries. In the oceans, oceanic oceanic plate conversions, yeah, you'll see those island chains. Okay, uh, sometimes they're not even on the surface yet, but they will be there. Okay. And I thought there would be another slide here, but let's see. Here we go. There's the one I was talking about. That which I think has to be about the smallest plate listed is the Juan de Fuca plate that sits off the coast of Northern California, Oregon, Washington, and um, northern, uh, south, southwestern Canada. Okay where this plate, the Pacific plate, is pushing that poor little plate into the North American plate. So along here, then you, uh, you have, you see these little mounds here? That's probably folded, perhaps faulted mountains there. But then underneath here, you have, or inland from there, you have Mount Shasta, what we consider an inactive volcano. Crater Lake, a beautiful, beautiful site in southwestern Oregon. Uh, a the crater is a former volcanic crater. It's right now dormant. Um, the Three Sisters, I'm not as familiar with those. Mount Jefferson, I'm pretty sure is volcanic. I know Mount Hood is. Mount St. Helens, for certain, is. Um, Mount Adams, this is why they call it the Presidential Range. Several of these, like Jefferson and Adams, were named after presidents. Um, and so sometimes they call this a Presidential Range. Uh, Mount Rainier is an extinct volcano, at least so far it's extinct. Glacier Park, um, now this, no, Glacier Peak. Glacier Park's over here, okay. Glacier Peak, Mount Baker, uh, volcanic, I'm almost certain. Uh, so all these are volcanic mountains here, though I bet you there's some faulted and maybe even some folded mountains along there too, okay? In the Canada, Mount Garibaldi, I'm guessing is volcanic. I don't, I'm not as familiar with that one, okay? So you'll have this going on. Where? Because the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting underneath the North American plate. And since it's subducting under there, we're losing parts of it. Now, it's going to take a long time. Maybe that's why it's such a little plate, because most of it's been subducted over time. You have to go way back here before you hit the Rocky Mountains. And here in the Rocky Mountains, you will have more faulted, fault block mountains, probably less volcanic, though you could have some really, really old, like here in the corner. Well, you can't see it here. Uh, it's, it's off the screen here, but at the corner of Montana, Utah, Wyoming, mostly Wyoming and Montana, that's where Yellowstone is, okay? And there was a volcano there at one time. Now, another really interesting feature of this, notice what they call these, this dark area here, plateau basalts. What? Basalts are um, ferromagnesium silicates, small crystal sizes, high iron content, very dark rock, and what are they doing here? They're inside this range of mountains. Well that must have meant that somewhere in the past these were some pretty active volcanoes here, and they were spewing their basalts this way, not underneath water, but in the land. And over time, that has been uplifted, making those plateaus. Now, my wife and I drove through. Uh, she had meetings in Salt Lake City, or near Salt Lake City, uh, Utah, somewhere right in here. And um, 
we got there a weekend early so we could do some touring around. We drove up through Idaho. I can't remember if we made it into Montana or not. And we went over here into Wyoming. I think we did make it into Montana short, just briefly. And we saw these uh, basalts here. We didn't see these over here, but we saw these. I mean, it looks like an old lava field there. And exactly that's what it is. But look how far they are from the closest obvious volcanoes here. And like I said, it, it's the other side of, of uh, Wyoming. This is just the edge of Wyoming. Wyoming's a pretty good sized state area wise. You're on the other side before you ever get to Yellowstone. It's the corner right up that goes along this line on the other side. That's where Yellowstone. So I don't think they came from Yellowstone volcanic eruption. These must have come for either from previous uh, volcanic activity or before. Or the other possibility is this was one time ocean floor here. This has all been raised since then and this has been pushed up. That may be where the one Fuca plate is underneath all of this stuff because this probably was at one time ocean floor. That may be why the Great Salt Lake is sitting right there. That's remnants a deep lake remnant of the salt water that used to overlie all of this. Interesting. Possible. Okay. Um, the earth has been changing a long time before we were ever here and will probably be changing a long time after we're way gone too. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? A lot of speculation hypothesis here, but boy, it's sort of interesting to think along those lines. And if my thinking is, and by the way, I don't think it's any surprise that this is a waterway here and here because you have some faulting activity has gone on here. Uh, this is near the boundary of these plates and it probably has been very disruptive here. Of course, you know, the San Andreas Fault goes right through here. Don't think it's any surprise that San Francisco Bay sits in there because of all the activity that's happened. You move on further south what, into uh, Mexico and the whole Bay of California, I think, sits along that San Andreas Fault. So where those faults have occurred, there's been lots and lots of activity over time. I bet you at one time Vancouver Island was part of mainland Canada. It's no longer. It's completely cut off. And my guess is the faulting that has occurred there let water come in and made it an island. Again, my guess. I don't, I wasn't there to see it. Okay, so I don't know if that really happened. That would be my guess. All right. That ends the slideshow. That ends the chapter. And as I say, in every chapter, and I truly honestly mean it, nothing replaces reading the chapter. So please, folks, if you haven't read it, go back and read it. Okay. And maybe, did I mention Jane H James Hutton before? I can't remember if we just barely had time to mention him. Uh, he is a blurb on page 498 before you get to the end of the chapter. Um, a Scottish natural philosopher who pioneered the whole concept of uniformitarianism, meaning what's happening now is the present is the key to the past, the past is the key to the present. What's happening now was happening before, you know, all things. Uh, it almost sounds like Ecclesiastes, doesn't it? But anyway, it's uh, uh, what has been happening before, still happening. What's happening now more than likely happened before. So he's a potential paper topic. However, this is not the source for your paper if you wrote on him. You have to go to an outside source to get the material for him. The book is not your source. The book's a great source for ideas for your paper, but it's not the source for your paper itself. Why am I talking so much about the papers? 
so far I've received zero from this class okay and we're more than halfway through the term folks Jacob is here let me get him in here all right Jacob here okay so like I said James Hutton would be a good topic if you read through this article you'll see I think I did mention this because you'll see other people like Joseph Black, William Cullen, James Watt, okay? Anybody I mentioned here would be potential. Uh, any of the things he worked on, uh, uniformitism, uh, any of his other works and publications. Um, Sir James Hall is mentioned, um, and many others are done. Um, Hutton came up with ideas that were not popular at the time, later proved to be true, so he was proved to be right, but he wasn't always accepted as right. That happened a lot in science, still happens, okay? Now, the summary that's given at the end of the chapter is to me one of the shorter summaries, okay? But it has a lot of italicized words, which are key terms, which are then mentioned also in the key terms. And again, that list is a bit shorter than normal, okay? You're uh, applying the concepts, though, probably has a few more questions than normal. It has 50 multiple choice questions. Now, in this chapter, this is a unique chapter, um, I made up a test from the test bank. But as I was just reading through and going through the things, I said, why are they picking at these nits so strenuously? In other words, they were asking questions about things that were just, it didn't seem like to me to be all that. Oh, oh, Caitlin must have gone out and had to come back because uh, I think I already got her here. Let me make sure. Yep. Yep, I got her here. Okay. So what I did, I changed the multiple choice. Now there may still be some multiple choice on it, maybe a couple, but I changed them to mostly fill in the blanks, okay? So this test is a bit different from the others that it's mostly fill in the blank. And the reason I did that, their multiple choice questions, they were, they were straining at gnats to swallow camels. I mean, it was just, uh, I, I didn't care for their questions at all. So I just went back and made up an, another test. So it's going to be a one-page test, but it has many parts to it, okay? Uh, so you'll need to, if you haven't read the chapter already, you'll definitely need to read at least portions of the chapter to find those points, okay? So but the applying the concepts will still help because it's still covering the same material that we've talked about. Then there's questions for thought. There's 17 of those. That's about normal. Uh, for further analysis, four. That's pretty close to normal. Maybe a little on the short side. Uh, 17 maybe a little on the short side. Uh, there is one inv invitation to inquiry about the earthquake patterns. And I think some of those questions are very interesting questions. They give a couple websites you could go to. If someone's interested in that, that would be a good paper topic. You might be able to get a couple of good paper topics out of that. Okay, then the parallel exercises are mostly to deal with the examples, which some of them were sort of, I thought, forced. Uh, so that's completely up to you whether you want to pursue those or not. All right, any questions on chapter 19? And like we said, we will have the lab starting at 4.15, so just a little over an hour from now, we'll stop chapter 20 and start the lab for chapter 19. And after we go through the lab, a lot of the last part of the lab, you're gonna be on your own. I'll stay on board as long as you need me to to answer any questions but you're going to have to be 
either on your cell phones, on your tablets, in your computers, you're going to be searching for places and finding basically latitude and longitude. Okay? Uh, so I'll let you do that to your heart's content. But I'll go over exactly what you need to do. So let me get out of this slideshow. I was trying to. There we go. So let's get out of this. Now I'm going to lose the screen sharing for just a minute uh, or two. Um, when I was looking before, I didn't see chapter 20, which I opened, but I didn't see it as an option. So I'll have to go and get it as an option. So hang on. I'll be right back back with you shortly okay I don't know if you can still hear me but here is chapter 20 okay can you okay you can still hear me there's chapter 20 okay can you see the slide for chapter 20 now Okay, so I'll set up the slideshow from the current slide, and it said the screen sharing stopped again. Can you see this or not? No. Oh, you can't see it. Okay, yeah. Well, it it's it's okay. Uh, it it had a banner on there saying the screen sharing has stopped, but yeah, I was seeing the screen, so. I thought, you're nuts. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. Okay. So, see, we're down to seven students now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We had eight. We must have lost somebody. Okay. All right. Chapter 20, Shaping the Earth's Surface. Okay. Just to get a fill in now of where we were and where we've been, where we're going. We, in this portion on geology here, okay, earth sciences we started with what were rocks and minerals we classified them we talked about them those kind of things that was chapter um, 17 chapter 18 was plate tectonics okay chapter 19 was how that went together to build the earth surface now chapter 20 how we shape the earth surface and this is a very intriguing picture here there's a part of me that wants to say it's part of the Grand Canyon, but I don't think it is. I don't see this mentioned here in the book. I don't even see this picture in the book. I think it's from an older edition. But it definitely shows an area. What kind of rock do you think these are? Do you have any guesses just looking at the picture? What kind? Okay, what makes you say iron? Okay, the streaks in here probably have high iron content but because they're in layers like this these are almost certainly sedimentary rocks that were laid down in layers okay some of the layers are high iron content and some are not high iron content but the rocks themselves are more than likely almost definitely sedimentary rocks now why in the world are you seeing the cross sections like this? Because in a sedimentary rock, this would be a, a more recent layer that would be a little bit older layer, much older, 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 until you get our ancient layers down here. Why are you able to see this? Water has probably come through. Say again? Erosion. Erosion. You got it. Okay. More than likely water erosion though you could have had some wind erosion and other. Now, looking at these nearly horizontal layers, I would say there's been very little folding in this area. There has been very few faulting in this area. What you have that shaped this area has been erosion of sedimentary layers. Now, this sort of plain looking area back here, I don't know. that may be where the water is either heading or came from that created this erosion. The water creating this erosion had to be going pretty rapidly. So it was eating away at the rock. What back here is much shallower or flatter, so the water flow is probably much more much slower. 
that's just my guess I don't know where this is I can't really tell what's happening here it may be this is an area that used to have a lot of water through it and then for some reason weather patterns or other things have changed a river may have changed its course something has happened and now it doesn't look I don't see any water here at all but I can guarantee you that valley was cut by water my guess is it was it could have been cut by glacier activity too I don't know that either okay your picture in your book which is probably somewhat of a similar area but it is uh, not quite the same it says weathering and erosion tend to sculpt or wear down the land sometimes leaving behind rock structures of more resistant rocks such as those you see here and that's the other thing here whatever rocks were in between that peak and this peak it probably was a solid layer here in there but that was probably looser rock less well formed rock rock that was less compacted less cemented something it got eaten away these are more resistant they stayed and maybe what uh, Roy was saying about more iron content that may have been making them more resistant but you can see the iron layers were cut on both sides so I don't that's not totally the situation but it's probably part of it okay here's the core well <laughs> I thought it'd be the core concept here's the core concept the surface of the earth is involved in an ongoing process of destruction and tearing down of higher elevation into lower elevations okay that's just the nature of the beast okay oh here comes one he must have had to go out and come back because I already have him here yep I did mark him here okay now does anyone know what this is a picture of I know some people will make some really logical guesses okay in a sense it sort of is but it's a natural dam it's not one man-made okay uh, it's sort of what we were just sort of kind of talking about before um, the picture that was in the book uh, of this you'll see it a little better this is harder to tell here uh, these rock right here I'll tell you they look a little bit this way here but it's the nature of the picture is not good these are very YOLO rock does that give you a hint yellow stone this is near the entrance to Yellowstone National Park the t-shirt I was wearing this morning hanging there on the door oh you can see it it's from Yellowstone my wife bought it there okay we have been here I can't tell for sure I think this is upper Yellowstone Falls okay that is a waterfall okay obviously a massive waterfall this is and that is the Yellowstone River up here the waters are going the river is going fairly slowly but here obviously moving quite more rapidly much more drop off here here's the part that's probably hard to imagine above the picture here is where the surface of the soil used to be that water has eaten away and eaten away and eaten away ongoing process of destruction and tearing down of higher elevations <coughs> sorry into lower elevations notice this is a deep v-shaped valley meaning highly eroded fairly young in geological age okay now the other part of this is this Yellowstone River from up there and here running down it's going to hit another waterfall that's almost as spectacular as this one maybe as much so okay and that's called the lower Yellowstone Falls and then somewhere below that not 
too much farther below that, you get Lake Yellowstone. And what L Lake Yellowstone is, is the crater of one enormous, enormous volcano. Unbelievable the crater could be that big. That lake is huge. And it's just part of the crater because part of it is filled with other mess, okay? It's just a little bit of that crater is filled. In fact, when you drive through Yellowstone Park, which can take a long time, it's not a small park at all. You cannot see it in a day, not and do it any justice whatsoever. Uh, it's, it's huge. And you'll be driving along and you'll see you're passing the Cadera, Cad, uh, caldera of the um, volcano. In other words, the rim of that uh, crater. You know, you'll be passing over, in and out, over and under. Sometimes you're inside it, sometimes you're outside of it. It's an in incredibly fascinating geological process. Here's what I can tell you. These rock back here, very resistant to erosion. The rock that used to be here, they were not so resistant. That's why they're no longer there. That's why you have a valley here, because in between here and here was solid soil, solid rock. And you see some of that soil is, rock has degraded into soil, and that's why you have trees growing here and here. And by the way, those are not small trees. Those are very tall pines, very, very tall pines. This is an incredibly majestic uh, view, upper, I think it's upper Yellowstone Falls. Please folks, if you ever can do it in your lifetime, when you retire sometime in your life, when your kids are young and you can afford to take them, get them to Yellowstone. It's just a fascinating place to see. Can't do much of it now because travel is hard to do, but when things get better, try to get there at some point in your life. It's well worth the effort. Well, I can't advance till I touch the screen again. Here we go. So we've been talking about this concept of weathering. Uh, I think Roy used the term erosion. Erosion is one type of weathering. But weathering in general is a very slow change, slow changes resulting in the breakup crumbling and other destruction of what used to be solid rock. Okay? Now erosion is what happens to it once it's broken up. Weathering is what does the breaking. Okay? There's usually three types of weathering. Physical. Now that has another name. The next slide is going to use the other name. Mechanical weathering, physical weathering, mean the same thing, basically synonymous. Number two, chemical weathering. And number two, biological weathering, or biological processes that lead to the slow changes resulting in the breakup, crumbling, and other destruction of solid rock. Okay, we'll look at each one of those separately. Basically, here's the synopsis. Physical or mechanical weathering is that weathering that is just doing breaking and crumbling. Okay, Chemical weathering is actually eating away at the rock. You're changing the rock's chemistry which makes it break apart, crumble, and do things like this. Biological processes are those that may have some physical nature to it, may have some chemical nature to it, or may be just purely biological its interaction with living organisms, as in trees or possibly animals, more likely trees or plants that are actually breaking away at the rock. Okay? You don't think a tree can do that, we'll see examples. Now, this weathering process contributes way back there to chapter 17, the rock cycle. Remember, all rock were at one time igneous rock. Igneous rock weathered and became usually sedimentary rock. Okay, sedimentary rock 
then could break apart and go back or they could get buried and become metamorphic rock. Igneous rock could become, okay, so you see weathering is part of the rock cycle. Without the weathering, you wouldn't have any sedimentary rock at all, period. Now the chemical weathering may lead to chemical sediments, whereas the physical weathering may lead to clastic sediments. So you see, everything we've studied is still appropriate here. Now, this weathering, would you say weathering was good, bad, or indifferent? Different. Yeah, you're right. Because sure, it's breaking up rocks, and you might say that's terrible, those beautiful rocks are being broken up, but here, part of the breaking up of rocks is what forms soils. Without soils, we do not live. Because soils, uh, I have a bookmark that I use in books that I'm reading. It says, soils sustain life. And you can't get a more true statement than that, okay? Without soils, we're dead, okay? Because we can't grow the food we eat. We can't, animals wouldn't have the forage they need. We wouldn't be here if we didn't have soils. But weathering also contributes to the term Roy used before, erosion, which is where we lose soils. So weathering can be good, formation of soils, it can be bad by making soils erode away. Okay, so it also contributes to movement of rock materials over the Earth's surface. And we'll talk about that feature of some of all of our weathering physical, chemical, and biological, mostly physical though. Now, erosion, that's usually bad, okay? It's the process of physically removing the weathered materials. Generally, we don't want that to happen. However, as we'll learn, sometimes some areas benefit greatly from other places' erosion, which again is this circular pattern of things always changing, always evolving, and winners and losers. Okay, so let's start with the first, and remember I said physical weathering is also called mechanical weathering. Okay, now that's the physical breakup of rocks without any chemical change. So whatever the rock was before, when it was a big chunk of rock, it just broke. Think of this. Let's say you had a big rock and you had a sledgehammer and you took the sledgehammer and hit the rock with it maybe many times and after a while you do break the rock into smaller pieces of the same kind of rock. You haven't changed the chemical nature, you've changed the physical nature where those um, bonds were holding the rock together, the crystal structure were holding it together, they've been broken by the weathering process. That's mechanical weathering. You're breaking the, the rocks apart without changing their chemical composition. Okay, now these are usually called disintegration processes and here's two of them. And we've mentioned this one a little bit before. Let's start with wedging. Now that's not what you did to your younger brother. Don't get that confused, okay? What wedging is often caused by frost, or I would say ice. But it can be caused, now here's where things get crossed up. If it's caused by trees, wouldn't that be biological weathering? It would, okay? But it's also trees are mechanically weathering things as well. And we'll find out later, trees are also chemically weathering. So the three of them get all mixed and mangled together. So here's what wedging is. All right. At some point, this rock got a tiny, tiny, say just a hairline crack in it, just a little crevice. And what happened to that rock, some moisture went down into the crevice. A little bit of water. Now, water, I think we've mentioned before, 
has to be one of the most fascinating substances on the planet. Now it's the most common substance on the surface of the earth because most of the surface of the earth is covered with water, sometimes miles of water, okay? But it's also one of the most fascinating materials. And I'll give you a few reasons for this and they, they kind of, the reasons sort of tie together. Water is two ox hydrogens and one oxygen, okay? Now, I set them that way because the two hydrogens tend to be on one end of a water molecule and the oxygen on the other end. It's not that it's hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. No, it's never like that. It's hydrogen, hydrogen, oxygen back here or over there, okay? Which makes water what we call a polar molecule. It has a positive end and a negative end. The hydrogens are slightly positive. The oxygen is slightly negative which makes water an incredibly good dissolver, a, something that dissolves other materials, especially if those materials are also polar in nature or ionic in nature. Water will dissolve them. Okay. Now, the reason I said that is there is a really good chance that that small hairline crack that was in this rock may have been caused because water got down in the crack and started dissolving away some of the softer, more soluble minerals. Okay, that would have been a chemical process, which we'll get to later. However the crack got there, water found a way in. Okay, now here's another reason that water is one of the most fascinating materials out there. Okay. And it sort of has to do with that polar nature of a water molecule, okay? Water ought to be a gas. Because if you think H2O, hydrogen one, another hydrogen one, oxygen a mere uh, see what is oxygen? Is it 16? No, eight, H2O. So its molecular weight is 10. No, did I look at it right? No, it is 16. I knew it was 16. Okay. Molecular weight is 16, which means water has a, I mean, oxygen, atomic weight is 16. So water's molecular weight is 16 plus 2 is 18. I would say every other substance on the earth with that small of a molecular weight is a gas. At normal temperatures and pressure, it's a gas, not a liquid. Think of some of your gases. O2, oxygen gas, there's two oxygens in that, that's 32, it's a gas. Nitrogen 28, it's a gas. Uh, carbon dioxide, 44. It's a gas, okay? Water at 18, why is it not a gas at normal temperatures and pressure? Because water has those strong hydrogen bonds and it doesn't let it, the other molecules fly around. They cling together and form a liquid, okay? Now, so another fascinating feature of water for anything that light of molecular weight, it ought to be a gas, yet it's a liquid at normal pressures and temperature. Thank goodness it is. Okay. Now to do with that again, how is that causing wedging? Well, let's go a step further. Those water molecules, which tend to stay real close to each other, because you see the positive hydrogen end of this one is attracted to the negative oxygen end of this one and the next one and the next one and they stay in really close contact with each other even though they slide past each other okay but when they get cold enough reaching the freezing point approaching the freezing point then suddenly those water molecules start rearranging to form their crystal structure Okay, now 
back off for a minute. Just about every solid on the surface of the earth, just about every liquid on the surface of the earth or anywhere, and just about any gas anywhere, when you cool them, the molecular motion slows down and they tend to shrink just a little bit. Metals will reduce in size when they get colder. Not much, but a little bit. Okay? Everything will. They get, tend to get a little bit smaller when they get colder. They tend to expand slightly when they get hot. Now, a gas expands big time or contracts big time when it heats or cools. Water? Water? Between 100 degrees Celsius, which is the boiling point of water, 212 Fahrenheit, and the freezing point of water, well, not quite, 4 degrees Celsius, which is 4 degrees above the freezing point of water, in between 100 and 40, and 4, okay, water does contract just a little bit, just a little bit. At high temperatures, it tends to be a little more expansive. At cooler temperatures, a little smaller until it gets to 4 degrees Celsius. Now, that would be around 40 to 38, something like that Fahrenheit, somewhere in that range. Maybe, yeah, somewhere in that range. At that point, when it cools, now those water molecules start rearranging themselves into a crystal structure which actually push them further apart. Water is one of the few if not only naturally occurring materials that expands when it cools. Only between 4 degrees and 0 degrees but that expansion is pretty abrupt. It's pretty large. All the contraction that happened between 100 degrees and 4 degrees, or just about all of that, is nothing compared to expansion that happens between 4 and 0 degrees. Now what's the ramification of that? Do you remember, I'm guessing about 4 or 5 years ago, when they had what they called the Arctic Vortex that came through and drop the temperatures here in Alabama to single digits and maybe a few places actually I'm, I'm talking on the Fahrenheit scale and maybe a few places even below zero on the Fahrenheit scale do you remember that do you recall it okay one reason I recall it is that we got a burst pipe okay um, we started hearing some water running somewhere and we looked and could see it in our basement between the false wall and the permanent wall of the house you could see water running there a pipe had burst it was near a vent that was to vent the crawl space uh, that you couldn't close and it got so cold it broke a pipe the one that went to our washing machine we had to have them come in tear up a tile floor um, find the leak, get it patched, and get it repaired. It it was, and we had no water for a while. Okay, we had to turn the water off, and it was very very cold. Okay, um, why did that happen? When water froze, it expanded, and it expanded enough to break a steel pipe. That is no mean feet. Okay? So how does that contribute to wedging? Well that water gets down here in that tiny little hairline crack but then it gets very cold and when it gets very cold it freezes and what happens when it freezes? It pushes the rock further apart. And then it's no longer a hairline crack, it's a little bit bigger crack. So the next season more water gets in the crack and then when it freezes pushes it further apart that's wedging pushing it apart until finally it does break what was a big rock is now two smaller rocks that's weathering physical breakup without chemical changes now I can't say there wasn't a chemical change 
that sort of created that crack in the first place? Maybe, maybe not, but the physical change, physical weathering is what made it break away. Now, another example of this is exfoliation. Any of you ladies know what exfoliation is? Or maybe you guys do. Oh yes, okay. They take that something almost like pumice or something and remove those outer layers of skin that are beginning to flake off anyway to give that nice smooth skin glow, you might say. Well, that's the same thing that happens with rocks. Remember we said we could have folding, maybe a magma intrusion way, somewhere way underneath the ground that's pushing up a layer of say of sedimentary rock and when you press it up that that was a flat layer like this now because of unequal pressures and having the stretch you break places that's a exfoliation reduced pressure effect fractures caused by expansion of underlying rock break apart the rock that's on top and that exfoliates or falls down now, I used to live in Georgia, and it's not one of my favorite landmarks. I mean, it's, the landmark is pretty incredible, but there's other things to do with it I'm not all that favor of. But Stone Mountain is an incredible, incredible hunk of granite, okay? And it must have been something like what we were describing before, a batholith or a lacolith or something like that that you had the intrusion underneath and um, but it formed underneath because it's granite large crystal size it had to have been intrusive igneous rock and then over time pushed upward maybe that same pressure that pushed it in the first place keeps pushing it upward but breaking apart the surface because if you've ever looked around Stone Mountain, there's gravel, gravel everywhere. Those are little pieces that have fallen off, just like you see these little pieces falling off here. Okay? Exfoliation, another form of mechanical weathering. Okay. Now, when we said tree roots, um, tree roots, because tree roots grow, they pick up pieces of concrete. Now that's not rock. That's a man-made thing, but you've seen that happen. I used to uh, walk when I was an undergraduate. I was a physics major. I had to walk from my dorms, which is an old part of campus, to the physics building, which was in a new part. Pretty long haul every day, you know, having to make that haul. And there was this one place along there where tree roots had just completely upheavaled just like this, the pieces of concrete and uh, for the sidewalk, you had to be really careful. If you weren't paying close attention, you're going to trip. Okay, you're going to fall. Well, that's artificial stuff. Look at rocks. Up. I've seen this at Smith Lake. I've seen trees that look like they are growing on rock. Well, actually what they did, I don't know if you realize this about roots at the end, somewhere near the end of every root, there is a tiny, tiny, tiny little structure called a root hair. And they call it a root hair because sometimes it's as thin or thinner than a single hair of a human being or a dog or anything else. It's that small. And that's where the action is in the roots because those root hairs have thin enough walls to them they can suck in moisture they can suck in nutrients okay they can also expel stuff and part of what they expel is an acid and the reason they expel the acid they're trying to in a chemical sense break that acid, that rock or that gravel or that sand or silt or clay apart and suck out the nutrients they want. Okay? I wouldn't be at all surprised if before this tree was here, part of this was all one solid rock. 
and what the tree has done is sent out little bitty root hairs into little bitty crevices in that rock and those root hairs secrete a little bit of acid which is a chemical weathering process making that a little bit bigger crevice or crack and then the root grows and pushes the rock further and further apart that pushing apart is mechanical weathering a lot like wedge oh, it is wedging is wedging by tree roots but it doesn't have to be tree roots it could be grass roots it could be any kind of roots that is another form of mechanical or physical weathering more than likely started by chemical weathering from those root hairs but once the root gets anywhere close to as big as these that you can see here it's no longer secreting acid it's just pushing the rock apart that's wedging mechanical weathering all right, now what went there, I don't know. Um, the picture in your book, I was describing Stone Mountain. Um, These are Shirakawa or something like that mountains in Arizona. Uh, you can see the gravel, boulders, other things that used to be part of that mountain range that's all that's left now okay pieces of rock and that probably was largely physical weathering not necessarily totally none of this is ever total they all work hand in glove okay um, I have several other pictures in the book one's a little girl walking between rows of trees and if you look carefully you'll see the pavement has been upheavaled by the tree roots. That's just uh, other examples. Now, at some point here, they move from physical weathering into chemical weathering. Now, the difference here is, and again, they work together, chemical weathering is decomposition of minerals by chemical reactions. Now they say minerals, it's not just minerals, it could also be rocks, just not strictly minerals, but also minerals. Now they mention three of these uh, chemical reactions. This is all of them. Uh, the first one they mention is oxidation. Now whenever you say oxidation, you should slash it and put reduction. Because whenever oxidation occurs, something else is being reduced. Okay, but we're not going to get into that part of that. It's a little deeper chemistry than what we need now. But what is oxidation? Anything reacting with oxygen. Okay, now let's go back when we were talking in chapter 17 about ferromagnesium silicates. Those were those with high iron content. What was one of the characteristics of the high iron content minerals and rocks? Dark color. Because that iron is usually very blackish. Okay? Think about magma, which is mostly iron that comes out of volcanoes. Very dark rock. The um, if we had been in class to do the what would have been the last lab uh, when we would have measured the density of granite versus basalts, two different types of uh, silicates, we would have seen those with higher iron content were dark. I mean, uh, I could take my computer into our bathroom and show you basalt rock that they used as part of the uh, flooring in you know the tile floor in the in the bath it's not really tile but similar to that in the bathroom the dark streaks are actually um, basalts okay but when iron reacts with oxygen what does it produce red iron oxides 
Okay. Now, what are I know this was true in Georgia. I think it's largely true in Alabama too. If you were to classify and just describe what a lot of our soils look like, what would you say they look like? Drive through. Say again. Red. And you call them red clays. And indeed the red color is on clay particles. The clays themselves are not red. The clays themselves are usually a milky white, sort of colorless kind of thing. What the red is, is iron oxide, just little bitty molecules of iron oxide attaching themselves to the surfaces of the clays. The clays are really small themselves, but not nearly as small as a molecule. That's what gives our soils the red color. Anytime iron reacts with oxygen, now I'm not talking with oxygen in a silicate, that's a different thing, but just reacts with, with oxygen, it turns red. Think rust. What was a dark, maybe shiny metal, once it rusts, it's reddish, okay? And it's not as strong a metal as it used to be because the oxygen reacts with the iron breaking the bonds, the metallic bonds that made the iron so strong and making them weaker by iron oxide. Okay, so that's one way, reactions with oxygen. And it's not just iron that does, that's certainly one thing. When hydrogen burns, it becomes water, believe it or not, that's the result of that. That's what you're doing right now. You are oxygen oxygenating carbohydrates that you ate for lunch or breakfast or sometime or another and that's why you have a temperature because it's giving off heat. You are burning carbohydrates. What is wood? It's a cellulose which is a complex carbohydrate. Okay, And when you burn wood in a fireplace you're oxygenating that. Okay. Now that's not forming a red iron oxide unless there's a lot of iron in that wood, which usually isn't. But you see, any of that kind of stuff is oxidation. Second of these is carbonation. Now I don't like that term particularly either. It's too restrictive. It says reactions with carbonic acid. What is carbonic acid? Carbon dioxide dissolved in water. Have any of you drunk any carbonic acid today? Yay or nay? Not yet? Okay, so you haven't had a Sprite all day? Or, or any other kind of soft drink? Or sparkling water? Okay, I really haven't either. The Coke I was drinking before actually has phosphoric acid in it, not carbonic acid. But most of the things that are carbonated, that's carbon dioxide dissolved in water. And when the bubbles come out, the carbon dioxide is escaping from that. Take a look at the acidity of those carbonated beverages. You'll find out they're very acidic. Not particularly good for the teeth, okay? not particularly good for your bones either, okay? Uh, they're not really all that good for you, especially the sugar in, the wa in those drinks, but even the sugar-free or zero sugar and stuff like that, you're still consuming a fair amount of carbonic acid. Well, that's why they're saying carbonation. That's not the only acid out there. So when I name this, I call this acidification. Carbonic acid is just one of several acids that you that do decompose minerals. Now what is the air mostly made up of? I've said it a couple times I think in this course. What's well, about close to 80 percent, 78 to 80 percent of the air is nitrogen. Okay? That nitrogen every time, and we've had a lot of these lately, you see a lightning strike. Some of that nitrogen goes to form some type of a nitrous oxide. 
that could be nitrogen oxide, nitrogen dioxide, nitrous oxide, some type of an oxide. Okay? And that nitrogen oxide combines with water, which it usually does in a thunderstorm, right? Now you form generally a fairly mild form of nitric acid. Now, nitric acid is way stronger than carbonic acid, but you don't have as much of it, okay? But when you also have, especially in air that's been fairly polluted over time, and you have any sulfur dioxide in the air, which you do have with smog and, and other things, anytime you have a fossil fuel plant, something that's burning, um, especially coal. Coal is really high in sulfur, okay? But even gasoline and diesel and anything like that, you're going to have some sulfur in there. When you burn sulfur, it becomes sulfur dioxide. When that combines with water, which it does when it rains, you get some type of sulfuric acid, which again is much stronger than carbonic acid. You just don't have as much of it as you do carbonic acid. And there's many other things out there, like I said, phosphoric acid. Uh, there are other acids. If any of those acids hit a rock, it doesn't matter what the type of acid is, an acid will eat away at a rock. Okay? So that's why I don't like to call it car carbonation. I call it acidification. That includes carbonation, but any of them. Now, any type of acid will, and they say easily, it will over time dissolve limestone. Now, it seems like it may have been Valerie that was asking, and I'm really surprised she's never been this late before, but I know every now and then she has to work or take people to the doctor or something like that, but she's not here today, I don't think. Has she checked in? I haven't seen her. But she asked one time about what causes sinkholes. And this was one of the answers I gave is that normal rain is slightly acidic because it has either some nitrogen uh, acid, some carbon acid, carbonic acid, or some sulfuric acid, or some type of acid in it because rainwater itself is not neutral. It usually is slightly acidic, and that acid water over time dissolves away limestone. And what are most of our underlying stone, uh, ground, oh, I can't think of the name of it, uh, bedrock in Alabama is limestone. So that's what causes some sinkholes, okay? Not always, but some. So. Limestone is just one, but anything. Remember when we said the lithification process of making those sedimentary rocks? Two parts, compaction. The second part, cementation. That cementation, those compounds that tend to make those grains of your plastic minerals stick together, and hold together, carbonation or acidification will eat away at the uh, at the cementing agents and then release the grains. There you've gone and dissolved away what was a rock and now has become fragment again, plastic materials again. So there's acidification or carbonation. The third is hydration. And that's the one I was mentioning before. Reactions with water. Hydria means water because it's hydrogen oxide, right? Uh, and when you're trying to rehydrate, you're drinking more water. Okay, dehydrate is losing water. Okay, Hydra hydration is water. Reactions with water. And as I said before, one of the most fascinating things about water is its incredible ability to as a solvent. It, it dissolves so many things, and that's why I said that um, uh, rock that you had the wedging in could have started with 
hydration. Water dissolved away some of the cementing agents that was holding that rock together because remember what a rock is? A rock is a collection of different minerals held together somehow more than likely cementing agents and the hydration could have dissolved some of those away. Now again if it's slightly acid you're eating away at it but water itself will just simply dissolve it away and that happens too. Okay. Now, kind of an example of this, um, now this is a naturally occurring rock, I admit that. The um, concrete that is our driveway. Our garage, the face of the garage, we don't have a gutter on that and water just drips off of that. Okay, and if you look closely at the bottom where that water drips, you'll see that the concrete has been eaten away there more than it has just a few inches either on the inside side or the outside side. Why? That water is reacting. It is dissolving. And maybe a little bit of it because of carbonation. Yeah, possibly that too. But water is eating away or dissolving. So hydration is the third of many kinds of chemical weathering, but the three major. Okay, let's see. Now, this is a picture I think that's in your text on page my page 509. It could be your 20-5. Um, I can almost guarantee you water ate through this valley and ate away the harder part of rocks, leaving the more the more resistant rocks here. The reason I say I can almost bet that it's water, look how rounded some of those are. If you see a lot of roundedness to rock, then remember when we were talking about uh, your classic sedimentary rock made out of gravel fragments. When they were angular, we called them breccia, and when they were rounded, we call them conglomerate, or vice versa. I never can keep those straight. But those that were rounded, more than likely meant those pieces had been undergone a lot of water interaction. Do any of you know what pea gravel is? It's a little pieces of gravel that are almost always rounded because they come usually at the bottom of a river or something like that where they've just been worn away, worn away, and worn away by water. So this is probably limestone here, and where the weaker limestone was weaker, you have the caves, the holes, the gaps there, where it dissolved more away, either the acid rain or just the water dissolving away that created there. Here, you see the stream here has eaten away. At one time, this was the bank of that stream, not down here, but up here. This looks like it may have been the original rock structure this is where the water has dissolved away either by hydration or maybe acidification or carbonation is eaten away at that. But you'll notice you have the rounded areas. These are more resistant sedimentary layers. You can see the layers there. These resisted the erosion because they were harder and it was harder for the water or the acids to eat them away. So you had shelves like here, okay? But the more easily eaten away are here. So that's all examples of chemical weathering. Largely to do with water, okay? Oxidation, when does metal rust more? When it's wet. Water there acts like a catalyst to make the oxidation happen. Carbonation, almost always something dissolved in water carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides, something dissolved in water. So water's involved here and then the hydration is totally, totally dealing with water. Okay? Now, what they left off here was the biological processes. But I've already mentioned how they interact with the other. The tree roots are obviously biological 
as well as being physical, as well as being mechanical, as well as being in many natures, in many senses, chemical. Okay, so these are really already included here. And when we talk about the decomposition, sometimes that acidification comes at the uh, source of tree roots, the root hairs secreting an acid that is eating away at the rock. Um, trying to think if oxidation has anything particularly to do with that. Maybe in some really obscure sense, but not so much. But see, the, the three of these weathering processes work hand in glove. I'm sorry. I've been going at it a long time today. I'm going to get some more acid in my system. Sorry. Right at the end of the can there. Um, didn't have much bubbling in it, but usually the darker, uh, this is just a general thing, the darker uh, carbonated drinks, they say carbonated, but usually the acid in them is phosphoric acid, which also does a really bad job on your bones so and teeth, so don't do too much of those. But every now and then I need a little bit of caffeine. Okay, so they didn't mention specifically a, a thing on biological, but it's always there, okay? In fact, sometimes biology, biological processes start them all. If you go out to any rugged, exposed mountain range, I'm thinking the Rockies, you don't see much of that in the Appalachians because those are very ancient mountains. They've been being worn away for years. But go out in the Rockies where you have fresh uplift, you know, uh, freshly uh, faulted mountains, you know, when I say that in the last few hundred or thousand years, you know, something like that. You go to that bare rock and take a look at it and you'll see little bitty patches of lichens or mosses or other things growing on the rock. And you know what they're doing? They're secreting acid so they can send out their little things like root hairs and cling to those rocks. Otherwise they get washed off the next rain. But they penetrate the rocks. So a lot of times your, your weathering, chemical or physical, starts biologically. Okay? Because something like that is growing on the rock. Now, this isn't rock, but it illustrates the same thing. <clears throat> Have any of you ever heard the term the Ivy League? The schools up in the Northeast who think they're real snooty, okay? They're supposed to be really, really high-ranked schools. I have my doubts, but anyway, they have a lot of prestige. Why they were called Ivy League is they love to have the ivy growing on the brick walls of those buildings. Okay. Oh, here comes Kermisha. Good to have Kermisha here. Let me mark her present. Okay. Now, those look impressive, don't they? In fact, do any of you have a wall of a building that you either work in or live in or something else that has ivy growing on the walls, the outside walls, not a great idea. Even that may look very neat and impressive, the red brick and the dark green ivy, not a good idea because if that ivy is hanging to the walls, that means that sending out little root hairs like structures into that concrete that's holding those bricks together, s dissolving that eating away to that. that's what holds it in place and you're actually uh -oh, my internet connection is unstable I'll quit talking okay did I break up some then a little bit, bit. that's because my internet got weak so I didn't want to say anything too important then because that stuff is eating away at the limestone that's in the cement that's in the concrete that uh, is holding those bricks together. 
not a good idea to have ivy growing on a wall. If it's growing on a um, wood structure, not a good idea either. It's eating away at that stuff too. Okay. Uh, if you see plants clinging to something, there's a reason they're clinging. It's usually a chemical reason. Okay. So let me get my slide back. So now we move to the most important part of the chapter. Now the reason I say that, I'm a soil scientist. That's what my uh, master's and doctoral programs were in soils. I did soil mineralogy and soil um, fertility for my master's and soil physics for my uh, PhD program. Uh, and yet they have one little section, less than half a page, one slide is all they say about soils. The most important thing in the chapter, and here they give it one little slide. What are soils? Mixtures of unconsolidated, that means it's not solidified into any structure, unconsolidated, weathered, remember, it has gone through weathered processes, which is good because it produced soil, earth materials. Now, earth materials means it could be minerals, it could be little rock fragments, anything such as that, but also humus. Now, here's a good word here. That's not hummus that they eat on, with Mediterranean food. This is humus. These are altered, decay-resistant plant material. Now, it can include animal material as well, but all animal material was one time plant material because there's no animal that somewhere back in its food chain you didn't have plants. So, uh, but this is usually plant material. Now, if I were to ask you to describe for me, especially since you can't show me something, describe for me what a rich soil looks like. How would you describe that to me? Anybody? Describe what you would say was a rich soil. Say again. A little bit fluffy, not, not okay, that's a, a very good point. Boy, you could make a good soil scientist. Okay. Boy, are you ever good at this. Okay, some other things to describe it. What you would classify really rich soil? Would you say anything about its color? Okay. Okay. All right. You're getting to where I was figuring someone was going to say. A lot of people would actually say black. Okay, a dark soil is going to be, oh, that's rich. Okay, actually, what the dark color is is humus. And humus isn't making up a large part of the soil. It's a lot like that red color that we see on clays. That's because a little bit of iron oxide is on the surface of the clay, making it look red. But most of that clay is not red, but the surface is wet. Well, humus when it's coating a soil particle, whether it's a clay, a silt, or a sand, that makes it look dark, okay? Now, humus itself, and basically what Roy was saying too, um, the biggest thing that humus does is doesn't really enrich the soil, though it makes it look darker and we think it's richer, because it seems like things grow better in that. Here's the reason they do. Humus is an altered decay, decay resistant plant material, usually a blackish in color that coats soil particles, the weathered earth materials, okay? And in coating them, that enables that soil particle to hold moisture more easily but also to release moisture more easily. Now, that sounds contradictory, but it really isn't, okay? Describe for me, 
or show or, or tell me some place that hardly any plant will grow. What kind of soil would that be? Name one. I'll tell you one place when I'm we're going to my home over in Georgia, uh, where I grew up. Yeah, say again. Is it? Oh man. Okay, that means we'll have to start over with soils on next time, won't it? Oh, that's too bad. All right, hit the most important thing twice. Okay, well, I have a mark right there now, so that's where the mark will stay. Okay, so we'll pick up with soils next time. Now, what I was hinting at there, one of, to me, one of the poorest soils is a sandy soil. And why I say that is sand is large particle sizes, which means it has large pore sizes, and yet those large pores let water flow right on through them. It doesn't hold the moisture. But you mix a little bit of humus with sand, and now you've got something to hold the moisture. Okay? But if you have a clay soil, really tiny particle sizes, those clays stick together like crazy and they hold on the moisture and doesn't let the plant root get any of the moisture because a clay soil can stay wet for a long, long time, but it doesn't let the plants get the moisture. And that's when Roy was saying a fluffy soil, that is a great kind of soil because usually that's going to have humus because the humus will then get in between the clay particles and let the moisture in, but it's also easy for the plant roots to take the moisture out. So humus is typically improving your water holding capacity of the soil rather than adding any real nutrient value. Yeah, it'll have some nutrient value, but that's not. Those dark soils, they grow things better mostly because they have humus in them, which makes for a better water regime for the plants to live. So we'll pick up from that next time. So let me for a moment here uh, escape from here. I thought I could escape from there. Well, I can't. Let me click on the slide and then try. Yeah, there we go. So I'm going to close out the PowerPoint. I probably we're screen sharing now, but as soon as I close it, we're going to lose it. So hang on. I'll get up the other things that we need. Hold still. Okay. Going to take me a little bit to get to where I need to go here. I can't get this to open. There we go. Oh, that's not what I want. Okay. That's not what I want. Okay. My last class ended less than five minutes before this one began, so I didn't have a chance to get all this open for you. Um, yuck. I'll be back with you soon. This is just taking longer to get to. Okay, that's what I want right here. Okay. All right. Why am I doing it this way? Let me do it through Blackboard. That's how I should have done it. Because this is how you'll need to do it. Okay, I'll come back to screen sharing in just a minute. Let me get Blackboard open. Thought I had it open already, but I must have accidentally closed it out. Okay. Yuck. All right.
Okay, I'm going to try to get you back in screen sharing. Okay, you can... Is this it? Yes, can you see my blackboard now? Yay or nay? Okay. I'm just doing this so I can walk through it. Um, of course, Roy's in the way again. I got him. Whoa! I just lost everybody except Roy. Okay. Didn't mean to do that, but that's okay. Got him out of the way anyway. So I'm scrolling down. You can see this, right? To my fiscal science for the summer. Fiscal science 111. There we go. And then we go up here to messages and here you'll see you're looking for lab six okay do you see where I am here it's PHS 111 L6 one's a word document and one's a PDF and it says here attached to the PDF which is the first part of lab 6 and a DOX, DOCX file which is the second part. Okay, uh, go on to say we'll be doing these today. So let's start the PDF. Okay, now, I hate to do it this way because it... Okay, there we have it. Have y'all opened this before? Okay. All right. Now, this is today's lab, part of today's lab. It's on latitude and longitude, and it's well worth your read to read through this. Especially pay attention to the bolded words here, and if you remember back when we were doing this in earlier chapters, the prime meridian, your prime, no, I'm sorry, the prime meridian is the meridian that goes from the North Pole to the South Pole through the Naval Observatory in Greenwich, England. Okay, that's what it is. That's where they start counting the, oh yeah, I'm sorry, should have started up here with, oh wait, I'm missing stuff. Let's start with the equator. Okay, sorry, let's back up some. The equator is the biggest of what we call the parallels. That's right on the center of the Earth. Okay, and if you go north or south from the equator you have other circles but these get progressively smaller as you get toward the poles right now those are called parallels because all of them are parallel to each other they never intersect each other those are called parallels the measure of those from the center of the earth the angle from the equator up to that parallel that's called your latitude it's how far north or south you are of the equator. Okay, sorry, that's where we should have started. Now, also on a globe, if you have a globe you can look at, you'll notice that if you hold the poles, okay, have a finger at each pole, there's a bunch of great circles that go all the way around the globe that all converge at the North Pole and again at the South Pole. Those are called your meridias meridians okay now the one that goes through greenwich naval observatory near london england a little bit east of North london england is called the prime meridian because now the equator that's the obvious place to start the the measure of your latitudes zero at the equator up 5 10 15 30 up until 90 degrees north or 90 degrees south that's the logical place when all these meridians are all equal to each other, then where do you start? Well, they just arbitrarily chose, maybe not arbitrarily, Greenwich Naval Observatory east of London, England. That's called the prime meridian. Everything else is measured from that. You measure east if you're going on toward Europe, Asia, you know, um, Australia and all like that until you have, get halfway around the globe. If you go west, then that's going toward the Americas, till the Pacific, until you get somewhere 
in the Pacific. Those, the angles between the prime meridian and any other place will be your longitude. Okay, so latitude is going to be north or south. So anytime you give me a latitude, you'd better have a letter after it. So many degrees, maybe so many minutes, maybe so many seconds, but then it should have either an N if it's north of the equator, S if it's south of the equator. Anytime you give me a longitude, it's either gone, it has some number, something between 1 or 0 and 180, 0 and 180 this way, okay? If it's going in one direction, it's going to have an E by east. The other direction is going to be W, west. So to measure latitude, you need an angle, maybe degrees and seconds, and that's north or south of the equator. And to measure longitude, you need a number, something between 0 and 180, and then either east or west of the prime meridian. So for latitude and longitude, you'll need a number, which measures degrees, and you'll need um, a letter measuring, indicating whether it's north or south for latitude, east or west for longitude. Now, we don't have any lumps of clay, so don't worry too much about the materials here. But picture what's happening with the material. What if you did get a lump of clay, a perfectly or near perfectly uh, spherical piece of clay, and you sliced it exactly halfway, that would be right along the equator, and then you also sliced it halfway down to that halfway point, and that gave you a measure there. So that's how you would begin. Now, I don't know if you all know what a protractor is. It's sort of a semicircle with degree markings all along it. If you place the, the protractor upright like this in the vertical position then, you'll see it measures 0 to 90 due north, 0 to 90 this way north. If you flip that over, you know, then it would be 0 to 90 south or 0 to 90 south in that direction. Either way, 0 to 90. But if you place the protractor on the horizontal part, then you would be measuring, if this was the prime meridian here, you'd be measuring 0 to 180 east. If you flip that around, it would be 0 to 180 west. Okay, so that's how we picture our latitude and longitude. The angle from the center of the earth, either north or south of the equator, or east or west, east or west of your prime meridian. Okay, let's scroll on down. And this shows the protractor on the north part, uh, either 0 to 90 north or 0 to 90. Uh, 0 to 90 north, either way you go here. Flip it over and it's 0 to 90 south. Okay. North Pole is at 90 degrees north. South Pole at 90 degrees south. Okay. Everything else is in between. 23 and a half degrees here, that would be the position of your Tropic of Cancer. 66 and a half degrees or something like that, that would be the Arctic Circle north. Flip them over and that would be your Tropic of Capricorn or your Antarctic Circle. Okay, That's how we measure latitude, angle, degrees north or south of the equator. Okay, now Scroll on down some more and then lay that protractor on the flat part, the horizontal part, and now you measure from the prime meridian here, and this would be going east, east 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees, 120 degrees, 180 degrees. This line back here, by the way, is called the International Date Line. Okay. We talked about that in an earlier chapter. But your, your longitude lines don't go 0 to 90. They go 0 to 180 
either east or if you went the other direction west okay so that's what you're picturing when you're giving latitude and longitude latitude north or south 0 to 90 from the equator and longitude east or west 0 to 180 one way or another east or west from the prime meridian okay now if you've read that first part you can go back and answer this question what information does the latitude of a location tell you so go back and read what we just skimmed over really quickly and that will give you exactly the information what the information does the longitude of a location tell you we, I've said it probably three or four times read it find out what it is now here's the part where you're going to need something else now if we were in class I would have up there for you um, an atlas for the state of Alabama I would have an atlas for the United States and I would have three world atlases the one for the state of Alabama you would then be able to find out where you live and in that find out your latitude and longitude we're not on campus anymore Dorothy so we can't be there uh, so what you have to do is find on a website find on your telephone some type of application that is going to tell you so you put in the name of your hometown whatever it happens to be and get the approximate latitude and longitude of where you live okay I will give you a few hints I think all of you are going to be something awfully close to 33 degrees north because we're north of the equator in the northern hemisphere I can't tell you how many degrees but it's going to be somewhere along the in the neighborhood of 33 degrees uh, you'll have so many minutes so many seconds now some applications will just give you a big old decimal number that's fine too if that big old decimal number has doesn't have a north or south with it but either doesn't have a sign or has a plus sign that means north if it is a negative sign that means south so when you answer the question now for your where you live all of you are going to be north I'll tell you that right now but in some of the other questions we'll be doing later you're going to have to list the latitude either with an N or an S by it and if the source that you're looking at is either plus or minus plus means north minus means south okay and then your longitude now I can't tell you exactly what it'll be but it'll be on the order of a hundred and eighty some no a hundred and seventy some odd degrees I think for your longitude of the place where you live no I said that wrong sorry sorry take that back 80 some degrees I said 180 at first 80 some degrees and we're west of the prime meridian because London England is to the east of us okay you have to go east to get to the Atlantic Ocean further east to get to England okay so uh, we are west of the prime meridian so whatever it is now on that thing if your source gives you a negative 80 something or another then you change that to 80 something or another west because negative means west with longitude positive means east negative means west some of your sources may give exactly what the east west north south will be others may give plus or minus you interpret those plus for latitude means north minus for latitude means south plus for longitude means east minus for longitude means west so find you an application find you a website anything that you can type in or look up or whatever your hometown and then find its latitude and longitude that's question number three now I didn't go into this in great detail but let's go back a little bit okay
all right here this paragraph right here tells you what minutes and seconds do it's on the very first page page 339 that's where you'll get your answer to number four explain how minutes and seconds are used to identify a location more precisely okay now question number five you'll answer when you finished everything else okay so and that's all that they have here on the thing, five questions that's not enough for a lab so that's why we go to let's go back to is it here oh here okay back to here and that's where the second part of the lab comes physical science 111 lab 6 the doc file oops I always want to click there I have to click here I, I wouldn't do this normally but I'm showing you how to do it download the file and when it comes up and finish counting and go okay here's the rest of lab six notice the other went through question five so here we're picking up with question six pick any city in Alabama not in Jefferson County now do any of you not live in Jefferson County or all of you Jefferson County residents you all are or you live out you where Oh, you're from Montgomery. Okay, so your first question, you're going to have a Montgomery latitude and longitude. So you pick any city in Alabama not in Montgomery County. Isn't that the county of Montgomery? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So you just change that to Montgomery County. Any city in Alabama not in Montgomery County. So all I was saying about your latitude and longitude for where you lived, you may have different from what I said. So you pick the city and write it down here okay uh, my wife's from Huntsville so I might choose Huntsville or I might choose Montgomery because I live in Jefferson County but Mobile or you know Elba or whatever you just pick any city in Alabama not in your home county pick it and then list its latitude and longitude now I'll guarantee you the latitude will be 30 something north and the longitude will be, I'm guessing something 80 something west. Okay? But I'll let you figure all that something's out. Okay? Then pick any city in the U.S. not in Alabama. Now, are any of you from not in Alabama? Are any of you out of state students? All of you, Alabama. Okay. So you pick any city in the U.S. not in Alabama okay write down the city here and put city and state by the way that's why I left a longer line here and then put its latitude put its longitude you will have to have some place now if you know a city you can pick it okay but like this next one pick any city in Canada and record its latitude and longitude okay well I know I've been to Canada so I know a few cities there you may not know any city in Canada so you'll need to get a map or get a site or get a an application or something that you can find the city in Canada once you found it then you list the city also list its latitude and longitude okay then go south and I say South America but if you want to do Central America that's fine too uh, pick any city in South or Central America pick the city but also name its country so I'll know which one you're talking about then give its latitude and longitude okay do the same thing for Europe now maybe you don't know specifically I know you know a city in Europe but if not pick a country and then find a city in that country okay but anyway find some sort of city in Europe list the city here both the city name and the country name and then also the latitude and longitude is this making sense so far yay or nay 
Okay. Now, when you get to Africa, I want you to pick two cities, each in different countries. Okay. Uh, so you might want to pick your country first, like Nigeria or Kenya or South Africa or Mozambique or any country in Africa, Egypt, you know, whatever. Pick a country, then pick a city in that country and list the city, comma, country, and then list its latitude and longitude. Then go to a different country, pick a city, its country, latitude, longitude. Okay? Now, while we're on twos, we'll pick any two cities from different countries in Asia. Okay? That could be Russia, China, uh, India, uh, Saudi Arabia, Bah Bahrain. I mean, pick a, any place, but list the city and the country with this latitude and longitude, and then go to a different country in Asia, pick it, a city from that country, the country name, its latitude and longitude. Okay? And then finally go to Australia. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Pick a city in Australia. Now, Australia also has states, so you might list the state as well, uh, but usually the city will be sufficient. Uh, but make sure it's in Australia and then list its latitude and longitude. I'll guarantee you something. This longitude is going to be south. That latitude, I'm sorry, the latitude is going to be south. The longitude is going to be east. Okay. But, and by the way, if you didn't want to do Australia, you want to do New Zealand, that would be fine too. Now, if we had been on campus doing this lab, what I had on campus was four cups. And I had written on little pieces of paper in those cups names of cities from those continents, okay? And you would have gone to the cup and pulled out, uh, for most of the places, one uh, city, and for other places like uh, Africa or, or Asia, you would have picked two out of those. And then you would have gone over to your um, atlas and found the latitude and longitude. That would have been a little bit more instructive, I think, but we're not there, so this is how we're going to have to do it. And actually, I found out a lot of students were using their telephones anyway. They weren't using the atlases, so not big difference here. Oh, you can't see this, can you? I'm so sorry. That was everything I was saying. I was thinking you could see I didn't even notice that the screen sharing had stopped. But that's what I was just reading. But maybe you're already looking at your own. Do you have any questions on this lab? Okay. Do you want me to stay on board with you in case you do have questions? Because uh, it's part of the lab. I don't mind being here. But if you are happy to pick it up and run from here, that'll be fine too. What do you feel like? You could look at a map or you could just go to a website. Uh, you know, you just need to define the city, list the city in the country or city and state if it happens to be in the U.S. Um, and then the latitude and longitude. You'll need to have a website that you can find those things. You might need two websites, one to find the city and another to find latitude and longitude. However you want to do it, that's, what you're, that's the rest of the lab. The first part of the lab was on the other uh, sheet okay this part of the lab is it's just finding it's actually 10 more cities if you had counted them there's uh, one two three four five six seven eight nine and then question six was another one in Alabama it's 10 so 10 more cities and then list the latitude and longitude that gives you your next 20 points added to the five of the other part of the lab. And be sure you go back and answer the question whether you think the lab was 
uh, instructive or not. You know that question five on the on the first sheet. All right. Sorry about not showing you this when I was talking about it. But do you have any other questions about it? Do you want me to stay on board while you're finishing the? Uh, oh, I forgot to mark the roll. Let me mark. It is 4:45, so let me mark it. Okay, Don never had came in, did he? I didn't see him. Okay, Capri never came in, did she? I haven't seen her. Bridget didn't come in. I haven't seen her. Nakaya, are you still here? Okay, I don't see Nakaya. I do see Caitlin. There's Caitlin, so I'll mark you here. I see Cormisha. I've got you here. I see David. I've got you here. I see Harry. I got you here. I see Jacob. I got you here. So let me scroll on down a little bit further. Okay, I've got one. I've got you here. I've got, there's uh, Nakaya, okay. And Roy, I got you. I got you, babe. No, that was something else. And Scott, I've got Scott here. Is there anyone present who you haven't heard me acknowledge your name? This says we have nine students. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yep. So it looks like we've lost Thomas. We, Patrick never came in today. Rod never came in today. Leon didn't make it in today. And surprisingly, Valerie hasn't made it in today. Maybe the first day she's missed. Okay. What's that? You, yeah. Well, I do know that uh, there was one day, I uh, haven't finished checking all the emails today, that she emailed me and said she either had a, this was a week or two ago, either had to go to work, was called into work, or had to take someone in her family to the doctor or something like that. So she, uh, she, she did indicate that she might have to miss every now and then. So, but so far she'd always made it back. Today she hasn't yet. Now, I hate if I'm going to leave if she's going to come in and we're going to be gone. So that's why I wondered. Are there any further questions? Do you want me to stay on board? To uh, if you run into any questions with this, I'll be glad to try to answer. Or does it seem like it's clear enough? Anybody? Okay. Well, uh, if y'all don't think you need me, if you do, I'm going to stay. But if you don't think you do, I do have uh, one meeting that started at 4 and another one that starts at 5.30. I told them, hey, I'm, I'm committed through 6.15, but if y'all don't need me anymore, then I can go on and join one of those meetings. But I don't want to leave you. If anyone, if any one of you has a question, I want to make sure all the questions gets answered before I leave. So anyone have a question? Okay. So all right for me to stop the share or does, do y'all need this left up here? Okay, take care. I'm going to stop the sharing then. And I will go on and end the meeting. Uh, but y'all can work with each other. You know, it is a lab.
So by all means, uh, work with each other if you have ways to stay in touch. Okay? All right. I'm going to end the meeting then. For everybody, take care.